All right, we're going to be in Luke uh, chapter 12 this morning. I have this um, definition on the screen because it's going to, this morning uh, we're going to primarily be speaking about covetousness. And even when he talks about in, in his return, it's still within that uh, framework of his teaching on covetousness and, and why, it's, um, why it's foolish. It's not just a, a command that we're breaking. It's just, it doesn't even make sense. It's a foolish thing. It's a foolish endeavor. Um, but because a lot of people, I don't, you know, it, our English word covet, the thing that's confusing about it is it can be used in a good way. Um, the Paul gave instruction to the Corinthians uh, he's to covet earnestly the best gifts. And uh, that's a good thing. Um, so it can have a good application. So whenever the scripture says, thou shalt not covet, uh, it, it, it can be kind of confusing. But also, I think that we tend to brush this command aside also and probably don't even think about it that much. So the reason why I wanted to start with definitions is for that reason. It's because a lot of people probably don't even know what it means to covet something. Uh, how is it wrong? What, you know, in what way and so forth. But I just wanted to start with a definition of the verb. It's to desire or wish for with eagerness. To desire earnestly to obtain or possess in a good sense. This, like I said, it gives the example from 1 Corinthians 12.31. And then the second example is going to be the bad application. And it's to desire inordinately, to desire that which is unlawful to obtain or possess in a bad sense. And then it gives scripture reference. Um, the, uh, the next one is the noun, covetousness, a strong or inordinate desire of obtaining and possessing some supposed good. A lot of times when people covet, they think, that the thing that they want is going to be good for them. They think that they, you know uh, that it'll it'll uh, bring them uh, good fortune or whatever. Uh, but it's always it's, it's always not the case. Uh, usually in a bad sense and applied to an inordinate, inordinate desire of wealth or avarice. I looked up the word avarice because I was curious about that, but it, it it's basically a synonym for covetousness. Uh, if you want to. Just apply just a, a really just a, a down to earth definition or, or a way to think of covetousness. Covetousness, it's when you desire something that belongs to someone else that you don't possess yourself. Um, it's not the same as, for example, want, wanting something that. Like you would like to purchase something from someone. It's not the same. Uh, I, I was thinking about trying to think of a good example. I don't know if this is a good one or not, but uh, there was a time when Abraham needed a plot of ground to bury his wife, and he wanted to purchase a piece of ground uh, from a Canaanite for that purpose to bury to bury his wife. They were willing to give it to him, but he was like, "No, no, no! I don't, I don't want you to give it to me because I don't want you to come." You know, it does, he didn't want him to come back and 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 say that. Uh, he owed them for anything. He's like, you know, I want to pay you and I want to pay you the fair price. Uh, that's not covetousness when, you, when there's something you wish to purchase. So it does get to be confusing. It shouldn't be that confusing, though. But we as Americans were blessed above and beyond, uh, the, you know, any civilization in the history of the world, I think. Uh, so uh, this covetousness is a sin that can be found commonly among us because people sometimes are never satisfied with what they have and they're, they're only uh, shooting for and wanting the things they don't have. Remember back not that long ago, there was this big huge, um, this big huge affair about the prayer of Jabez. Uh, remember that? And all that was was in the, in the scripture, one man asked for God to enlarge his borders. And, and do something, I don't remember, but it was just one, I don't mention in that one spot, and it's like, yeah, the prayer of Jabez, I need my borders enlarged, I need more possessions, I need, and, and, and people are uh, drawn to this message, and a lot of the mega churches have this same message, uh, that they treat God as if, 
he exists solely to help them acquire more stuff. And uh, Jesus taught just the opposite. And so he's going to warn uh, his people, he's going to warn us about the, the, the dangers of uh, covetousness in these next verses. Now in verse 13 is where we begin. He says, uh, now he just got through talking about the, the sin that can't be forgiven, by the way. And we, we covered that last week. Now he's going to be talking about the sin of covetousness. And uh, one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? The, so he, apparently this guy might have a legal claim. I don't know. I don't know how they work their... Uh, uh, how they dealt with their heirs, uh, if, it, if it primarily would go to the oldest and then none to the youngest, uh, or if this guy was the oldest and the youngest was getting it all and he was getting nothing. We don't, we're not told the circumstances, so we really don't know. The only thing is, is it might have been something that he had a legal claim to. We don't know that. But Jesus' answer is, what have I to do with any of this business? Uh, am, I, am I made a judge or an arbiter uh, over this? The answer would be no. Uh, Jesus is not concerned with this. And then he says in 15, and he comes with this warning, because apparently the heir, uh, uh, the so-called heir who is troubled that he's not getting uh, what's rightfully his, Jesus attributes that to covetousness. And when you think about it, it could very well be because Oh, I think it could very well be. It is. If Jesus attributed it, it is covetousness. Because what he's wanting, he's wanting something that he doesn't have. He wants something that belongs to someone else. And he wants something that, that uh, it, he's coming from that mindset that so many people do. If I just had this possession, then I would be happy. That's what people are really seeking. They're really seeking happiness. And they think that this one thing or this other thing uh, will bring us happiness. And so that's why it's being pursued. And when that thing is acquired, it only changes to the next thing and to the next thing and to the next thing. And, and, and you're really never happy. Uh, sin never, never satisfies. It, it always requires you to pursue it more and more and more and more until you're in a hole so deep that uh, you can't get out of. Uh, but... Jesus attributes his desire for this as covetousness, and covetousness is one of the Ten Commandments. You know that Paul himself said this about covetousness. He said it's idolatry. And, you know, we, when we think about the law, Paul says as far as his conduct goes pertaining to the law, he said he was blameless. If you watched Paul's life, uh, you wouldn't know that he was a lawbreaker. Uh, because outwardly, he honored his parents. Outwardly, he didn't commit adultery. He didn't steal. He didn't take the name of the Lord in vain. Uh, he didn't do all the things that the Ten Commandments forbid. But uh, covetousness is one of those sins that is a little bit more difficult to see outwardly, but you can. It'll, it'll come out. Uh, but Paul says this in Romans chapter 7, that it was that sin that made him guilty before God. And what I mean by that is, Paul says that he thought he was doing the law. He thought that he was doing well. But, if, but, but the law that said, thou shalt not covet, that's the one that condemned him. Because then he became aware of what covetousness was and that it was against God's law. So it, it, it would appear to him that, that no matter how hard he tried, that, that that thing would keep creeping back up into his life. And uh, when you look at Paul's life after he came to know Jesus, though, there's no sign of covetousness. Uh, Paul did work to earn, earn money, but you don't see him pursuing earthly endeavors and acquiring possessions and acquiring uh, a property and acquiring positions. You don't see any of those things um, after his uh, conversion. But before that, it was a problem for Paul, so apparently. And it's... Quite possibly, you know, a problem for, for, for many people without even realizing it. But uh, I think that if we come right down to it and, and uh, really consider uh, what it means, we, a great deal of us might be uh, more guilty than we'd like to admit. 
And he says that uh, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. So we tend to think that way though, don't we? When we go buy someone's home, a million dollar home that has, you know, uh, 15 rooms and three garages and uh, 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 boats and travel trailers and, and all, the, all these things, we, we tend to think that, boy, wouldn't that be something to, to have all that? Maybe in the back of their mind, maybe you become wiser in your old age and decided that it ain't worth it to try to keep up with something like that. Amen. <laughs> Because yeah. well, I'm thinking that same thing now. I'm thinking that our house is too big. Yeah. And I want something small, real small. But, uh, but uh, at, at any rate, that, you know, we tend to think that way. To think that is success. That when someone has all the pretty things and all the nice things and all the best things that the world has to offer, we think of that as being successful. Do we not? I mean, that's the reason why people pursue careers. And, and, and uh, uh, to set themselves up and to have all the best things and have all the nice things. And when they do get it, we consider that to be successful. Jesus says, do not consider the possessions that a person has as a measure of success. Don't do that. Uh, that will keep you from being covetous. That will keep you from being jealous and envious because they're all tied together. Um, it, it's, one of the, it's the idea of that you know, this, this guy is coming from is I want what's rightfully mine. And what it's really doing is it's driving that person into a bad state. He's not content and he's not happy, but not because of the possessions that he lacks. It's because of how he's looking at it. Uh, you can be content with the things that you have. The Bible instructs us to do so. And matter of fact, when someone does unlawfully take something that belongs to us, Jesus instructs, Give him something else. You know, give him, give him what he took. And, and, and be done with it. Uh, there, you know, you, you, there, there, is a, a, uh, there is definitely merit to his instruction in that. And uh, people wonder, well, why, how can we do that? And this, people just not just run over us and destroy our lives or, or whatever else. Uh, they might could do that anyway. Um, I mean, that, that could happen to anybody. But I'll tell you what, you'll never regret obeying the Lord. You'll never regret doing what He said. He says a man's uh, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And He spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Um, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then, then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So he, he gives this parable to let them know that the pursuit of possessions is futile. It, it, it ends nowhere. And, and uh, what uh, uh, you can't when you die, and that's something that we're all going to do one day. When you die, you cannot take your possessions with you. It's amazing that this idea, you can see covetousness, covetousness in children, most especially, uh, because they'll throw away everything they have just to get what the other person has. You know, they can have all the best in the world, the best toys, but if someone's having a good time with a stick, they'll throw all that down to get that stick from that other child. That's, you can see that in, in even children. Uh, it's in, it, that this idea is, is in us. And... Uh, I remember when I was a boy, uh, matter of fact, it was, uh, I got to open some Christmas presents early because my grandfather had passed away near Christmas and we were going to be on the road. And uh, 
uh, I had gotten a thing I had had my eye on. I seen the commercials on the Saturday morning cartoons, and it was the six million dollar man uh, uh, action figure. It wasn't a doll; it was an action figure. <laughs> and uh, he had his uh, capsule, his space capsule, and it doubled as a lab where they would build him back. You know, it was bigger and better and faster and all that. And I got that for Christmas, and I loved that toy so much. You could roll his rubber sleeve up and see the circuitry in his arms and all that kind of thing. And I remember asking my mom, because death was on my mind, because my grandfather had just passed. And so now I'm wondering, as a young child, uh, I just got this really neat toy that I really, really liked. And so I'm wondering, well, what if I died? I won't be able to play with it. So I asked my mom, if I died, could I take this with me? And of course she told me, no, no, you can't take that. And I said, what if I held on to it real tight when I died? Because <laughs> I really didn't want to risk uh, losing that $6 million man if I happened to die. But uh, it's funny the things that go through a child's mind that, that demonstrates our true nature. We typically put more emphasis on things and possessions than what we should. It doesn't mean that we should live like... Uh, like uh, 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 bums on the street and not own anything. Uh, it, it's just whenever we, we place too much importance on it, uh, so much so that we start being and practicing, uh, we start being covetous and we start practicing uh, covetousness. And uh, he says that also that we can't take our possessions with us, but uh, it also makes us dwell on the things that we don't have. Covetousness does which also causes anxiety. And, and Jesus talks about uh, anxiety in these next verses, uh, starting with 22. He says, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life that ye uh, shall eat, uh, what ye shall eat, neither for the, for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither reap, excuse me, for they neither sow nor reap, uh, which neither have storehouse nor born, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? Now, when he says taking thought, um, it doesn't literally mean that. He, what he's speaking about is anxiety. Uh, he's not saying you shouldn't think about what to eat or what to wear. Uh, he's saying you shouldn't worry about it. You shouldn't be anxious about it. But it's covetousness that drives us toward that mentality that causes us to be anxious because we're worried about whether or not we're going to get that thing that we think that we need to make our life better, to, full, to, to, get, to give us fulfillment. And um, he says to consider, you know, that, uh, that the, you know, the birds, uh, the fields, consider the lilies, and, and how they grow. Uh, they toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O, little, o ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of a doubtful mind. Um, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather, and this is the remedy to covetousness, this is the remedy to anxiety, to worry over the things that you do not possess. He says, for, he says but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. All the things that we would worry about that we don't have, Jesus says don't worry about what you don't have. Worry or but look to what you do have. Seek the kingdom of God. Reach out toward the kingdom of God and let, the, let God and your relationship with Him be your motivation for the things that you do and for the actions that you take. And the interesting thing about that is all the things that you would be worried about are added to you. God gives them to you anyway. He takes care of you. The... Uh, uh, he goes on to say, uh, let's see, uh, 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 fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 
Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourself bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that, fall, that faileth not. Where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he says it's not necessary for you to own an abundance of things. You could even sell it and, and give that money to the poor. Now he's not saying to, make, to, to, to not provide for your family and to make your life destitute in order to enable uh, 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 people that are homeless because they choose to be that way. Sadly, that's the case also. But Jesus isn't talking about things like that. Uh, people tend to hold on to their wealth, to hold on to their things, so much so that, they, that they're at least reluctant to, uh, to give it to other people or to at least help other people out in a time of need. Uh, the sad truth is that so many, there are so many people in this world that would take advantage of such things. Uh, true enough. Uh, but that doesn't need to change what we do and our behavior uh, toward this type of thing. It's very, very simple. Seek first God and His kingdom. And all the things that we think that we have to have that are necessary, He adds to us without us worrying about it. Jesus says worrying doesn't even add anything to your life. It doesn't put anything worthwhile into your life. It only puts things there that are uh, destructive. To you and to your well-being. But seek the kingdom of God. And he says the things that you do, giving alms, helping someone in need, uh, 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 you know, uh, these, these are the things, he says, that sets treasures in heaven for you. And, and everything that we do, now you can do things for the wrong reason. You can go help the needy so that you can post it on Facebook and tell the world about it. So look at how nice I am and what good things I'm doing. You don't even have to use social media. You can just tell your friends that. That's the wrong reason. You're doing something. They call that these days virtue signaling. I don't even know where that phrase came from, but that's what they call it today. Uh, but um, what it is, is, is boastful pride is what it really is. And, and uh, you're trying to show the world, look at me and look at how wonderful I am. Um, uh, they're... they're uh, so if you can do things for the wrong reason. That's the reason why I added in my notes in His name. Because if you do it in His name, you do it as if it were Jesus Himself doing it. And Jesus isn't boastful and He isn't proud. And when He does things to help someone, it's only to help that someone. And, and when everything that we do in His name for other people is a deposit in the treasury of heaven. That's what He says. Put yourself treasures in heaven. And where your treasure is, there you'll be. Isn't that a nice sentiment? Isn't it a nice thing to know? That the things that I do for other people in the name of Jesus will not be forgotten. It makes a deposit in glory. And I think that's a wonderful thing. A wonderful encouragement for anybody to do things that are good for other people. And not worry so much about yourself and what you have and what you don't have and well so and so took that and that I deserve that and, and those kind of things. They lead you nowhere. Seek the kingdom of God and he'll add all those things that you need. And he, he says this, he speaks about his return uh, uh, in this context. Because he, that was what the thing was he was talking about when he was saying to beware of covetousness. He says that you can plan on collecting all these things and expanding your borders and expanding your storehouses and collect more stuff, but tomorrow you could be standing before God. And so he's, that's his return is, is, is when judgment comes. And so now he shifts the, uh, uh, the speech to be watchful about uh, his return, to be ready. He says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. When he will return from the wedding, uh, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may be open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch, and find them. So blessed are those servants. And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken through. 
Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh in an hour when ye think not. To me, that is a... It, it, not only is it an assurance that uh, we need to be ready at all times, that Christ's return is imminent, uh, it, it's also... Uh, an assurance that whenever someone comes up and says uh, this is when Jesus is returning, that that's not when it's going to happen. Because he, I mean, he said himself, it's going to be in an hour that you think not, not an hour that you think so, or that you. Uh, but the idea is to be ready, though. An interesting thing, uh, Peter says uh, unto him, Lord, do you speak, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? So he's wanting to know <laughs> if what he's saying applies to everybody or just to them. And interestingly enough, Peter also spoke on this subject in his first letter. And, and I wanted to share that reference with you in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. And he talks about the things, possessions that you're blessed with. And it talks about being hospitable and, and, and generous and being good stewards. He says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now he's repeating what Jesus taught him. To be watchful. To be ready at all times. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. That's what Jesus is teaching here. So Peter got it. Thank the Lord. Um, For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. As the Lord has blessed me, I need to bless you. As the Lord has blessed you, you need to bless me. You need to bless others. Um, Even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. Uh, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. He doesn't say to, to, to give above your means. He doesn't say to make yourself destitute in order to earn favor in heaven. He doesn't say that at all. He says according to the grace that God has given you, just share it. Just share God's grace with other people. Peter understood at this point and, and, you know, that Jesus was talking about everyone. Uh, the... Uh, not just, not just the disciples, but all of God's people. Uh, this is what we should live by. I know this is a lot of reading, but I, I want to get to the end of it because it, it all goes together. Uh, and the Lord answered and said, it says, and the Lord said in verse 42, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. So who does it apply to? It applies to anyone that the Lord finds doing his work when he returns. Uh, Anyone. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. uh, And if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. And shall begin to beat the men's servants and maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken. Now it's important to know that he's using a parable, an example here. And says that the Lord when he comes is going to make him Lord over all that he has. Uh, It's important to note that serving the Lord and doing for the Lord, you'd lose nothing. Not in this scripture, but the scripture tells us, the Lord tells us that when you give to the Lord, he repays you back a hundredfold. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's, that's like 10,000%. That's what the Lord... So you can't... Whenever you give something to someone else, whenever you help someone else in a time of need, it's not like you're, you're losing it. Uh, it's a deposit in another account, an account that can't be, uh, that can't be stolen, an account that can't be corrupted. He goes on to say, uh, the Lord of that servant... If he it says, if I, but if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to eat, excuse me, begin to beat the men servants and maidens and eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware and will cut him in asunder and will appoint from him his portion with the unbelievers and that servant which uh, knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. 
But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men shall uh, have committed much, of them they will ask the more. Now, it, Jesus speaks of judgment here, and he gives an interesting uh, hint as to what judgment is like. Uh, because we, we might get the impression, well, I didn't know any better, so I'll be pardoned. But he says right here, the punishment is lesser for someone that doesn't know any better, but it's still present. It's still there. And I come to send fire on the, it, uh, on the earth, and what I will, if it be already kindled. But if I, a baptism to be baptized, but I now, excuse me, I'm getting really tongue-tied. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and now I am straightened till it become accomplished. Um, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. The peace that Jesus gives is inward and individual peace. But the world is opposed to Christ, and the world is opposed to those that love Christ. So that's what he means by this. He's not coming to give peace to the world. Uh, they won't have it just because of that reason. They won't have it. They don't want it if it comes uh, uh, through Jesus. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. And the father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, and the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, and the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So he makes it real clear that what he's bringing with the gospel is going to bring division. Uh, now these uh, next verses, it says, and he said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say there is coming a shower, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? That can be applied today even more so than it was applied back then. Because we know that it's at least 2,000 years closer than what it was then. It's getting very close. And he's saying that you can discern the times and this falls along with him being ready. This is why we shouldn't be so concerned with material wealth, with material things. Uh, it's because Jesus is coming. Uh, and his return is... He speaks a little bit more about it in his last few verses, starting with verse 57. He says, Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell thee that thou shalt not depart thence until thou hast paid the very last might. Now he, he tells them to judge, and he gives them one more example. And he says it's, what, it's preferable that if someone has something against you, if you have an adversary, and y'all are going to the magistrate, y'all are going to the judge, wouldn't it make more sense to settle that on your way to the judge before you actually go to the judge? Because if you take it to court, there's a chance it might not go well for you. But if you go ahead and, and work it out uh, with your adversary while you're on the way, you don't have to go before the judge and there's no, you don't have to go to prison. But people think about this, excuse me, people do not think about this in terms of eternity. And that's what Jesus is getting at. Is that He's coming and His coming is imminent. But yet the world so foolishly like this man is more concerned about what He's going to inherit uh, rather than considering it's only going to be mine for a short while and someone else is going to inherit it from me because we're going to have to stand before God, each one of us, and we're going to have to give an account. Rather than, rather than consider that, they're going, people are going to worry and fret over the things they don't have and what someone else has and they have more than me and uh, there's more in their glass than I was given to drink. You know, that kind of a thing. And... Uh, but the Lord is telling us that there's things that we should be much more concerned about, and that's His return. 
And that's when we stand before God. Not just His return, but we also we, we meet Him whenever we pass, whenever we die and leave this world. None of this is permanent. None of us is, are here permanently. We will all have to leave this state. And uh, But He t says here that it's, uh, it's far more desirable to put treasure in heaven. That only makes sense. But uh, people tend to think, never think in these terms. That, and they think that, well, I'm still living and I'm still getting by doing the things that I like to do and as if they're going to live forever. And um, while there's a chance, while there's an opportunity, you know, the time, the scripture tells us the time of salvation is now. When you hear the gospel message that Jesus was crucified on the cross for your sins and that uh, you, your faith in him will save you and that God raised him from the dead, that's what saves you. That Jesus was crucified, God raised him from the dead, and if I believe in him and trust in him, then I'll be saved. Uh, that, uh, that is what is, that's, what, that's what's important. But people will put off making a decision about that to a later date and might even think that, well, I'll just wait. I don't know that this God exists. I don't know that this gospel is true. I'll just wait and see what happens. It's a very, very foolish thing. Because what Jesus says here in his example is you wait and go to see the judge and you're going to go to jail and you're going to not get out. Uh, this is the way it is for eternal life. People have a very wrong perception about God most of the time and, and so many believers do as well. But it's not God's desire to cast anyone into hell. That's where you're going if you don't know him. And it's his desire for you to believe in him and trust in the sacrifice he provided with his son. Uh, and we can do that now. We can take care of that now. But if we think we're going to wait until judgment day to make that right, it's not going to work out. And that's what Jesus is telling them here. Forget about these earthly possessions. You need to worry. You, you have a court date. And you're on the way right now. And you're going to stand before the judge. And you're going to have to give an account. And that's the things we need to be concerned about. And we need to be more concerned about our eternal destination than we do about what our neighbor has or, or what we don't have. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Uh, Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time together and we do thank you, Lord, for this uh, word uh, from, from Luke. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to take this message to heart and help us to know, Lord, that uh, you're going to provide each and everything that we need if we would just trust you. And if anybody's he uh, hearing this message today, Lord, that, that has not trusted in you as their Savior, I pray, Father, that they might be encouraged to uh, before it is too late. And Lord, we uh, thank you for the salvation that you provided. We thank you, Lord, for giving it freely as a gift to us that all we need to do to receive it. Because I know, Lord, if it was any more complicated than that, there, there would be some way for us to mess it up. Thank you, Lord, for making your salvation complete. And thank you, Lord, for making it available to us all. I pray that you would help those that don't believe that they might have their eyes open to see their guilt before you and they might believe in the Lord Jesus. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and stand.